Well, good morning, church. It's been an eventful week. Talked with many of you, and I think uh, a lot of people have frustration uh, about not necessarily results, but more the process uh, that has happened in the election this week. We had a, uh, a funny little video to kind of lighten the mood of collectively what it might sound like if all of our inner voices were heard. And so it was kind of a scream together. We deleted that, but <laughs> it still played anyways. So I just wanted to share that with you that if sometime throughout the message, I thought I should warn you if there's an audio clip, because we've deleted it, but sometimes it still plays. So I didn't want to be preaching and all of a sudden there's a collective scream that you hear over uh, the speakers that just, that is us inwardly crying out in frustration. Uh, So that may happen. It may not, but just be prepared. If it does, we can just have fun with that together. So I want to remind us again, just like last week, that our hope is found in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. And I know this week that God used the election in my life as a reminder to me how often and easily my heart runs to the things of this world. I don't know if you encountered that or you saw that, how you could be doing meaningful things. I could be really spending time with my children or my, my wife or doing something that is important. And I would have this nagging feeling, this desire to reach over and grab what? My phone, not my wife's hand or not the Bible for the kids. It was my phone to get an update. What's happening? What's happening in the world? What's the next update? And so it reminds me of in the Old Testament of how the nation of Israel, they, they longed and they cried out for pagan gods, but they also longed and cried out for a king like the other nations have. And so we should be in and of the world in regards to uh, the church and even voting politically, but this world is not our home. And so there's a tension there that we live in this world and that we be good stewards of all that God has entrusted us to. But also I know for me, it was a continual reminder this week of where I'm continuing to place my hope in. And it was kind of an idol of my heart that God was revealing um, that he's sovereign, he's in control, he's my Lord, he's my savior, and uh, that he has sealed my heart for eternity. And so I wanna encourage us in that this morning, I wanna open us up in prayer that we can collectively pray this together about the sovereignty of the Lord, the grace of the Lord, and that our joy and our hope is not found here, but in Jesus Christ who lives inside of us as the temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray this morning as we just confess that reminder. God, we thank you that we are in the world, but we're not called to be of this world and that you have redeemed us through your blood. God, we we pray that we may um, be above the fray. And I know that's difficult because also to to be a good steward and a citizen here, you have blessed us with the ability to be involved in the political process, uh, both locally and nationally. And so we pray you give us wisdom on how to do that. But ultimately, that it's not about bringing about um, just earthly results, but spiritual kingdom results. And so may you work those out uh, in the church, work those out in our hearts as well. Help us to see this as opportunities grow closer to you. We know that your kingdom is going to be established, uh, that your ways that you are sovereign over all things. We pray for this morning, for this new series, that it may encourage our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, you can open to the letter of Galatians, and we had an outline. If you don't have this outline, you can raise your hand and we'll get you one, Uh, but we have an outline. There's a couple of hands here and here. Um, I was going to give you mine, but I need it, so they're going to get you one. Um, So starting a new series, normally we go verse by verse uh, through this through the book of the Bible that where whatever it is we're working on, but with an overview, it's a little different. We're gonna try to back up and give a whole picture of this overview. And having an overview of a book is really, I think, one of, uh, one of the most important steps that's easily overlooked in Bible study, but vitally important. I find it extremely helpful to know before I just jump in and start reading a book of the Bible, to know its purpose, its author, its setting, what it was written for. And so... Uh, We really need a simple system, some organization. Now we can memorize scripture. There was one over here. Uh, We can memorize scripture and that has incredible value, 
but we should really also be memorizing scripture in the context of the book that we're in and understanding how that book is to be used. One of the keys in organization and cleaning, not that that is my strong suit, but my wife is really good at this. So something I've learned from her is uh, organization and cleaning. One of the key concepts is everything needs a home. Have you ever heard any of that before? Some of you have heard like, yes, everything needs a home. Everything in your house needs a home. So when I look over at my dresser and it's cluttered, it's because those items either don't have a home or I'm lazy, okay? And so if there's a whole bunch of items that continually collect there, I have a problem. These items either don't have a home to go in or I'm just not following through in my system. Well, the same is true as we study the Bible and memorize scripture. Everything needs a home in how we work together through this. So learning the purpose of a book, why we understand a book, what it's for is like giving that book of the Bible a home in our mind. Um, We all like a, a clean house, a clean garage, I know probably we don't have a clean garage if we're like uh, many, maybe just myself, don't have a clean garage, but that's what we desire and that's how it should be with the Bible as well, is we like organization. So this morning you have an opportunity to learn what Galatians is about, the purpose and the drive of the book, and then it will become a tool in your toolbox of when to use the book of Galatians, when you should turn there and what you should use it for. So as an example, we just finished Jonah, And I want us to go through a few minutes and think through when and how and where we would use the book of Jonah. Because we just preached through Jonah multiple weeks, multiple months. And if we don't know how we would use Jonah, then it really, it wasn't, it wasn't successful in what we were trying to do. Uh, So typically, if I was to ask one of you, could you tell me about the book of Jonah? I, I want you to think, what would you say? Now, last week I did a terrible thing. Is Dave and Linda here? I'm not gonna call on you. I don't see him. We can pray for Dave and Linda. I called on Dave and Linda last week, all right? It was their first time. And I'm like, hey, I remember your name, Dave and Linda. I called on Dave and Linda, and they're like, I'm never raising my hand in church again. Um, So pray that they come back, Dave and Linda. If you're watching online, I'm sorry. I will never call on you again. I'm not going to call on anybody this morning unless you raise your hand. But I want us to think through with the book of Jonah. If your friend came up and asked you, hey, what is Jonah about? I heard you just went through this in your church. What are some some things that we could tell them besides it was about a guy who was swallowed by a fish, he spit out, and he went and preached in a city? Like that's generally what the book is about, but that really doesn't help me today or often in my life. So what are some key concepts in Jonah that kind of help give Jonah a place in our mind? Question for us, you can raise your hand. Yes. Okay, you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. Great, okay. Practical example where you could turn to Jonah and use that in someone's life if they're running from the Lord. Yes. Okay, God's patience and long-suffering. That's a key concept. That should be one of those key areas in Jonah. Patience, long-suffering, running from God. What else? Some other areas in Jonah that we see. Yes. God's grace. Perfect. So these are big titles that should fit in our mind under the book of Jonah. When we think Jonah, we think compassion, grace, patience, and we can't escape from the Lord. Anything else? Obedience. Perfect. Yes. God's will will be done. Is that an important concept for us to understand right now? God's will will be done. That means God is sovereign over all things, right? The depths of our wickedness. So all of these are important concepts for us to have and for us to see. And we should think through, I can turn to Jonah in these circumstances. What about that God could change an entire nation in just a few days? God changed the heart of an entire nation. That's something God can do. God is sovereign. He is in control, something we need to be reminded of all the time as well. So it's that type of understanding. When we think Jonah, we think compassion, grace, our wickedness, sovereignty of the Lord. We can't run from God. That's how it should be categorized in our mind. So when we're talking to somebody and they need to hear about the compassion of God, or they think they've sinned so bad, God could not forgive them. We can turn to Jonah and we could show them the Assyrian empire, how they, they did horrible, wicked things, but God showed them compassion. And even if they're a professing believer, 
and they sinned horribly, how God restored Jonah, who was having a horrible attitude. So these are some concepts we can turn to if we have them kind of in our mind. And that's the same we're going to do with Galatians this morning. So Galatians, one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament, was written around 50 to 51 AD. We have a map here of Galatia. It was a region. You see that area in the green uh, by Turkey. And so you have Jerusalem down here in the bottom right. But that whole area was considered Galatia. And so there was a couple of churches there, churches in that region. We read from the book of Acts was Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And so that's in Acts 13 and Acts 14. We read some of the churches that were located in that area. So this would have been a church-wide letter that was sent out to numerous churches in the area. So it applies also to churches today as well. And it would have been a benefit for every Christian to read as well. As we read Galatians, we're going to see that Paul wrote it in frustration and passion. He was passionate about what he was writing, but he was also frustrated. And he, he calls some names and says some things that are pretty serious that we're going to see in the book. Uh, the background for Galatians, as we're coming to it to understand the, the Jewish background, Gentile background, is in the Old Testament, we see from outward appearances that God chose the nation of Israel to be in a relationship with. And if you wanted to be in a relationship with God, you had to do what the nation of Israel had to do. You had to follow the laws, the covenants, and the commandments. But along the way in the Old Testament, we saw that one day God would save Gentiles. Can we think of a book where God demonstrated compassion and love to show on Gentiles? Jonah, right? He just did it. We just saw it where he saved a nation of Gentiles and who was upset about it? Jonah, right? And so this is what we see. God gave some glimpse along the way of what the Messiah was going to do in the future. However, many Jewish people thought God was going to bring about by force a Messiah, a conqueror, a unifier, uh, establish a new physical Israel, rebuild uh, the temple in that way, and frankly, establish a kingdom. But in the New Testament, we read how Man's idea of the Messiah and God's idea of the Messiah were a little bit different. Yet the Messiah completely fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies, including the ones that they weren't really focused on. So there became a clash between the the Jewish people who thought the Messiah was arriving for them and also the Gentiles who were receiving the Messiah as well. You see, the Jewish people thought for thousands of years their Messiah was going to come, and to be a follower of that Messiah meant you had to become Jewish. In the Old Testament, God made the covenant with the Jewish people. If you wanted to become following after him, you had to become Jewish. God demonstrates that it wasn't about keeping the law, but instead it was about having faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah who perfectly kept the law. We see all of this. It's not about observing the rituals or the sacrifices. It's instead about giving praise to Jesus Christ. It's no longer about sacrificing a lamb for your sins. It's about understanding Jesus Christ was the lamb for your sins that was sacrificed. It's not about going to the temple to worship God, but understanding you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not about worshiping a king. It's about worshiping the king, Jesus Christ. Not about a priest, but it's about the high priest, Jesus Christ. And so they had a lot of this backwards. In fact, all the elements in the Old Testament they were called to do were going to be done and did through the Messiah. So as I mentioned, the Jewish people for generations believed it was going to come one way, but Jesus arrived quite differently. And at first, the the Jewish people were excited about the Messiah. Many of the Jewish people, the religious leaders, not so much, right? We've read that. But the majority of the Jewish people were excited about Jesus coming and them receiving the Messiah as Lord. And then what started happening is Gentiles started believing in Jesus Christ as well. And the Jewish people said, time out. We've been waiting for him. We've been following the rules. We've been doing this. We've waited thousands of years for our Messiah to get here. He's our Messiah. You come to the Messiah through us. And there became this division. The Gentiles didn't keep the laws. They didn't keep the Sabbath. They were unclean. They didn't keep the kosher eating rules. So that was the dilemma. 
And we see in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 10, uh, the apostles giving the gospel to Romans and Gentiles continuously. And they were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And here was the problem. If we summarize the problem, it can be in this point. Jewish Christians, right up here, I think, maybe. Jewish Christians at first saw Jesus as, I skipped, a, I skipped a page. Jewish Christians at first saw Jesus as their Messiah rather than the Messiah. That was really the, the culmination of those two points together is that Jewish Christians at first saw Jesus as their Messiah rather than the Messiah. That's a, a major issue. It's a difference between a Jewish Messiah versus a Messiah of the world who is Jewish. Do you see the difference there? One is he's a Messiah. He is the Messiah, yet he's Jewish. The other, he's Jewish Messiah. In order to come to Messiah, you have to become Jewish. Well, ultimately this erupted it, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, if people give you a hard time or they say, you don't follow any of the rules, and they point to the Old Testament and they show how you're not following any of the rules of the Old Testament, Christians are supposed to follow those things. It's Acts 15 that you can point to in the New Testament that points and shows why we don't follow those anymore. So the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 was comprised of the apostles and the church elders in Jerusalem. And it's quite incredible we see the authority uh, that God placed with the elders of local churches. I mean, you have apostles who walk with Jesus Christ, and they're going to sit down at the table. In Acts 15, it says, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. It's pretty incredible that the apostles sat down with the, the newly appointed church elders, and they decided... It wasn't like what we see in the Catholic church where there's a hierarchy system and you have like the apostles that were considered the Pope and they had more authority than the bishops. No, they were both sitting down, apostles and elders sitting down because the apostles understood God was transitioning the church away from apostles and transitioning to elders. It was apostles who started the church. It would be elders who would continue to train the church and raise up future elders. So in Acts 15, 6, the apostles and the elders gathered together, consider the matter. The matter they were considering were really two questions, and we have them here for you. In Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, this was the agenda. Do Gentiles first have to become Jews before they can become Christians? The second question, do Gentiles have to observe the Mosaic law after they become Christian? Those are the two questions they were trying to figure out. How does it happen? How does somebody come to Christ? Secondly, once they come to Christ, in order to stay a Christian, what must they do? Well, the, the summary here is that for both of these questions, they came to the answer, no. So do Gentiles first have to become Jews before they can become Christians? The answer was what church? No. No. You don't have to become Jewish first. Do Gentiles have to observe the Mosaic law after they become Christian? No. And so this is what's going to be spelled out in the letter of Galatians. So we've seen the history. We've seen the background. We saw the dilemma. However, at the council, they came up with four rules. We could call them guidelines. Four guidelines for Gentile Christians to follow. These were not rules to be saved, but they were to build harmony between the Jewish church and the Gentile church as they met together and worshiped the Lord. So I want to go through those four guidelines real quick. The four guidelines, Gentile Christians should abstain from food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, meat of strangled animals, and blood. These would have been the big, big issues in the life of the Jews that they could, it would be hard for them to get along with. And so we see here that they said, listen, to bring about unity, stay away from these things. It's not what make you a Christian. And staying away from these things are not what keep you a Christian, but they're going to help build unity in the church that right then was comprised of Jews and Gentiles. Kind of peace within the church. So in Acts 15, we see the apostle Peter and we see Paul. They both stand up and they affirm how God has shared the gospel with the Gentiles. Yet it's James, the half-brother of Jesus, who stands up, half-brother, different father, 
right? If you're wondering about that half-brother. So different father, he stands up and he's the one who recommends that the church should write a letter to these churches in Galatia to explain to them what they have decided and how this works. And so we see that it was in Acts 15 that they recommended this letter be written. And that is probably what Galatians was, was Paul writing this letter to those churches about their findings. So they don't have to observe the Mosaic law to remain Christian. They don't have to become Jewish to be Christian. So moving forward, this comes to the purpose of writing Galatians. Paul hears, he one day hears that the churches in Galatia, they're they're being taught. There's some people that have came into the church and they're teaching Jesus, which is great, and keeping the Jewish laws and circumcision. They're saying, listen, you can be a Christian, you can follow after Jesus, but you need to do this, and you also have to be circumcised, and you need to follow the laws. This is my, uh, what we could call gospel plus theology. It's going to be one of our points this morning, gospel plus theology. Now, you've probably not been to a church, or we've probably not heard very many struggles in the church today about following Jesus and circumcision. That was in their time, that was an issue in their time, but we will talk about later today some issues in the church today where it's gospel plus, where it's Jesus and something else, because it's, it's this form that takes on many other false teachings in the church. So we've gone through background, setting, Jerusalem council, the issues, and the dilemma. Now we're going to quickly go through the outline here that Paul wrote. We have the outline, the key theme is justification by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. It's all about Jesus Christ, not by obedience to the law. It's not anything you do, it's what Christ has done. What keeps you in the faith is not anything you do, it's what Christ has already done for you. And so the purpose of writing is to confront this gospel plus works teaching. So as you're thinking through what Galatians is about, it is about the essence of the gospel. It is when people are having a struggle of what what makes me saved? Why am I saved? Am I saved? What keeps me in the faith? Galatians would be a great book to turn to. So we see in Galatians 5.1, one of the key verses, moving through chapters 1 and 2, we see this grace and the gospel. Grace declared in Paul's message, demonstrated in Paul's life. He defended in Paul's ministry. He talks really about uh, where his sources came from. We're going to see in chapters one and two, Paul comes out of the gate and says, listen, this is not from man. I think in our issues areas today, there's uh, anonymous sources of information and news. Have we heard any of those things in the news the past couple of weeks or months where there's anonymous sources of information or there's an anonymous source that came about? We can be encouraged that in church, we never have to come and say, I just want you to to know what we preached two weeks ago, we found out was false. Because God's word doesn't change. And so he comes and he says, by the way, what I'm teaching you is not from man. It's not from some anonymous source. It's from God's word. It's from God himself. And so he lays that out in chapter one, that this is from the Lord. It can be trusted. Moving to chapters three and four, he gives arguments of why this can be trusted as well. The personal argument, scriptural, logical, historical, sentimental, allegorical argument. We're going to work through all these uh, throughout the series as well. So there's kind of an outline. I encourage you to keep this uh, in your Bible. Take notes on it uh, throughout the course of the time. You can take a, a break for your drink right now. So. Thank you. You made me feel not left out. Some people raised their glasses here. I want us to see as we're coming to the end of our time this morning. Hey, I just realized the scream didn't happen. Perfect. All right. It's coming through the end of our time this morning. There's one last point I want us to see here. In the book of Galatians, one of the very first attacks on the gospel of Jesus Christ came from where? Where where did it come from, church? From within the church. It's what we're going to see in Galatians. One of the first attacks on the essence of the gospel came from within the church. 
You would think one of the first attacks on the gospel would come from the world, come from outside of the church, but it actually comes from those who were all right with Jesus. They were saying Jesus is good. They were professing Jesus. And it was a dangerous attack that was coming from people professing Jesus Christ, enough to Paul to write a letter to these churches, blasting these people saying they are false teachers, reject their teaching. It was anti-gospel. I've read how some biblical scholars in seeking to systematically categorize every area of the New Testament found that through their study, the warning against false doctrine and false teachers is emphasized more in the New Testament than anything else. It's emphasized more than love and more than unity. Something for us to be aware of because often we just skip past that point and say, well, let's just all find ways to get along. Let's find ways to get along with people who don't have the same theology, biblical theology, as in the central gospel issues. Now, we all have differences of theologies in non-essential points, but when it comes to the gospel and the central focus in the church, we have to be maintain unity in those areas. Anyone who comes with another gospel, Galatians says there's not another gospel. And so we need to confront that type of teaching. Earlier in the outline, I talked about Jesus plus theology. The people coming into the church, the Judaizers, is what they were called. They were coming into the church. They were teaching Jesus plus obedience to the Jewish laws equals a Christian. That's what they were coming in and teaching. Look and act like us first in order to get God. This Jesus plus teaching can take on many forms uh, in the church today. I, I wanted to ask maybe some of you, and I have some as well, but what are some areas you see or maybe you have seen in the Christian life or in churches where they say Jesus plus this equals Christian? What are some areas in, in your life maybe that you've seen that connection take place? Yes. Okay, perfect. Immersion with, with baptism, that you have to go through baptism this way. If you don't, you're not a Christian. Perfect. What's another one? Denomination? Yeah. So can, can you think of a denomination that says, says that? You'd rather, <laughs> I was putting you on the spot rather than me. Uh, I'll say the Catholic denomination said that. And so if you go look at some of the previous popes, they've stated that if anyone who believes justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, let them be anathema. So that's the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Now, they may not hold that today, but you go back in the past, that's what they have said. Anyone who believes faith comes about by Jesus Christ alone is not saved. That's their teaching. Now, I know that a lot of times they don't hold to that today, but that is the official teaching because they have works added in there. So something to be aware of. What else? That was a great one. I didn't have that in my notes. Works. Perfect. Yeah, we can add anything to works. It can be, you, know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Gifts of the Spirit. Have we, have we seen that before? That you're not a Christian unless you do such and such. We've seen this as well. Any type of legalistic rules that we add to the gospel. Is there any more? Can you think of any? You have a smile. Do you have one? Like, not that I want to say. Okay, great. So, uh, example of this, a large church near me growing up, this was before I, I was Christian, I would see these signs on this church. And before I say anything about the church, I just want to say I had friends who attended the church who were Bible-believing Christians, okay? And so they loved the Lord, but they went to this church. And on the outside of the church, facing a major highway in town, the church, they had the cross. And then on each side of the cross, they had uh, some extra things that they believed in. The left side said, if we could put these on the screen, the left side said, fundamental missionary, independent, KJV 1611. And on the right side of the cross, it said evangelistic, premillennial, traditional, and just for good measure, another KJV 1611. So as you're driving by, you see the church, you don't see anything, Jesus, Christ, the gospel, or anything. You just see all of these statements in huge letters. Now, I'm not saying the church said you had to believe in those things. And by the way, if there are some of you who fall into some of those categories, that's great. 
That's not what makes you a Christian. Those are just your beliefs. But what it looked like on their sign was, this is what a Christian is. This is what it means to be a Christian, or at least this is what a Christian looks like at their church. It looked like the prerequisites to belief. So I'm glad to say that church no longer has those signs. I think they've changed from that. They've seen some of those things, but that's something we should be on guard about. When we say to be a Christian means Jesus and whatever it is. I've spoken about these attacks coming from inside of the church, trying to redefine what makes someone a Christian. But in reality, these church can also come from outside of the church as well. Last week in uh, Thursday, in our men's Bible study, Steve, I think it was Steve, where's Steve at? You're back there. All right, Steve shared this. I thought it was great. I asked him for the quote. It was by Philip Ryken. He said this, if you want to start a good argument, and who doesn't, right, church? I mean, if you want to start a good argument, start talking about religion or politics, either one. But if you want to start a war, then bring your religion into your politics. So let me discuss for a moment politics and religion to start a war, right? I briefly want to discuss these because recently, politically, and how they relate to legalism, I've seen in Galatians, and it's been happening in our country in the church. This election cycle, I've seen so many from outside of the church guilting Christians and seeking to bully Christians into what they must be against or for to truly be a Christian. It's the same thing. If you're Christian, Jesus is fine, but you also have to do this, or you also cannot do this. And it's funny that those who profess Christ, or those who do not profess Christ, are seeking to tell those who do profess Christ how they must act and what they must do in order to be a Christ follower. And it's ironic, they directly often bully Christians in ways that it always seems to be against the guy or for their guy. Like, it always lines up that way in promoting their ideologies and their worldviews at the end of the day. They try to take an advantage of Christian principles, even though they don't believe in Christian principles. They try to make you use your Christian principles to go their direction politically. One Christian attribute we need to be on guard for, they often seize on is one of compassion. They say, Jesus had compassion. You're a follower of Jesus. You should have compassion as well. And we should have compassion. But they would also say, your compassion must lead you to these principles. And that's where we need to be on guard against it. They use compassion as a club on many believers saying, why would you take funding away from that? You just don't love them. You just don't have compassion on them. You can find ways through compassion to justify abortion. You're just not being very compassionate on the mother. And so they use compassion, and many Christians give into this, and it's the same thing the Judaizers were doing of Jesus is great, but you need Jesus plus this if you're really going to be a Christian. There's a meme that I, I see every now and then, and it's really using Jesus and his compassion as a club for their political views. I thought I'd show it to you this morning. It says, then Jesus drug tested everyone using taxpayer money before deciding if the lazy freeloading masses were worthy enough to receive fish and bread. And then Jesus concluded, I can't feed these people. It will destroy their incentive to better themselves. Okay, and so you see this, it's really trying to use compassion as a, as a hammer, as a club to say, this has to happen in our political sphere for those of you who follow after Jesus. And it's manipulative, it's deceitful, and it's hypocritical. And so this is what's often being pushed. If you're Christian, you can believe in Jesus, but you also need to believe in this political idea. They seek to use Christian attributes and compassion to try to make Christians follow their political ideologies. And sadly, many Christians fall prey to this garbage. It's a form of legalism, and it's a form of controlling you and controlling others. It's Jesus plus theology. It's Jesus plus theology. Since you're Christian, you must do this, and you must do that. We can also remind people, I don't pay taxes by getting a coin out of a fish's mouth. I mean, there's a lot of things that Jesus did that we don't do as well. So I also find it so ironic in this election cycle, and again, I'm only bringing this up 
Because when politics and the Bible begin to collide, that is a sphere we as Christians are supposed to be talking about. We're supposed to be in the world, not of the world, but we're also Bible-believing Christians as well. So I found it ironic this election cycle that all of a sudden, secular society, news media, politicians, Facebook friends of mine, that historically could care less about morals, sexual sins, pride, and issues of hypocrisy and the like, all of a sudden became the cosmic moral judges to the church and the Christian. People who could care less about those things in the past all of a sudden began to seek to tell me as a Christian or you as a Christian how you must vote as a Christian when they could care less. Now, they don't believe in Christ, but since you believe in Christ, you have to do this, and they get to do what they want to do. And it always happened to be against the guy whose political positions they didn't like. I saw this argument over and over and over again presented to Christians. The argument was this. You can't vote Trump and stand up for any biblical religious values. How many of you have heard that? You can raise your hand. All right. There's a lot of hands up. You can't vote this way or you can't vote Trump and consider yourself a Bible-based Christian. They would only say it about that side. They would never say it about the other side. And I want us to see this is legalism. It's manipulative. It's not that society all of a sudden grew a backbone and became convicted of their sin and the dangers of it because it was always against the person they didn't like and for their person. So it was manipulation. It's the same thing with the hearings of Amy Coney Barrett. Again, I say this because they're using the Bible as a club and I think we need to stand up against that, but they use it for their purposes. For example, I saw this argument. I couldn't believe I saw this argument. It said she was unfit to become a justice and it was wrong for her to do so because she would be neglecting the raising of her children. She would be neglecting her role as a mother in the home. When I first heard it, I couldn't believe it because since when has secular culture cared about the importance of the nuclear family? Since when have they promoted that as as one of their main importance? But all of a sudden, it becomes a bludgeoning club that you as a Christian have to be for this. But they don't have to be for their whole life. But now when it comes to this point, they, they bludgeon Christians with this, and then we have to submit to it, let alone about a, a woman's primary role to be wife and mother in the home. That was their argument. It's pure hypocrisy, and it's legalistic. It's seeking to control others using Christian morals and beliefs. It's the same thing we're going to see in Galatians. They come in and they say, hey, Jesus is fine. You can believe in Jesus, but you also need to do this. You also need to do this. And we need to be on guard against this form of legalism and Jesus plus theology, both from within the church, it happens within the church, and from outside of the church. Because it is not out of a love for Jesus Christ they're telling you this. It's not because they love Jesus and they love you. It's that we get used. And the same thing is true in the church. We must be on guard. Are these people coming in telling us this because they love you and the Lord and are seeking unity or are they seeking to control you? That's what was happening in Galatians. And that's where Paul writes and says, there is no other gospel but the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we add to it that makes us saved. So as we come to a close, we see here that we need to be on guard. We need to be on guard in this world, in this life. We can trust in Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, his life, his resurrection. That's what we are here to celebrate in the church. God's word is always true. We will never come back and say sources were wrong, right? We can always say this is true. This is right. We must be on guard for that. So would you pray with me this morning. God, we thank you so much for your goodness in this life. God, there's so much for us to have wisdom about, how to live in this world, but not be of the world, how to be involved in our country, where we do have a say in politics and with voting. We, we could even say in some ways in other countries where the citizens who are Christians have no say in government, that that would be easier in some ways because we know that we don't have any say 
And it would just be all trusting in you. But here we do have a process and we're thankful for that. We're blessed because of that. And it's a unique nation for that. But we also come into the dilemmas of, of how do we walk out our faith? We can't separate a person from their belief. And so we understand the difficulty regarding politics and um, being a follower of you and how those intersect in the public world, especially in the political world. So I do pray for your church during this time. We thank you that this week, uh, remind us, God, that you were not up in heaven wringing your hands in, in angst and anxiety about this election. I know many of us, we can get focused on that, and that is just something that is a, a revelation to our own heart and our mind about trusting in you. So I pray that you may continue to grow that trust, help us regardless of what direction the nation goes, whether our person won or our person didn't win, that we are trusting in you, that we're trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it was your life, your death, burial, and resurrection, that our salvation comes about by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. God, we pray for within the church, help us to be on guard against this gospel plus theology that we can so easily grab to because we love, we love works-based religion. My heart longs for that. If I can do better, then I'll be right with God. And this also happens outside of the church. So I pray for us as a church and as Christians to be on guard um, when we are attacked or we are uh, oftentimes try to be manipulated by this Christian belief where they are promoting Christ but not really believing in Christ. Help us be on guard. Help us to worship you uh, this morning as we go about this week. We pray for the storm that's coming, that you may keep everyone safe, and we thank you uh, that you have our um, soul in your hand and that we can trust in you in everything that comes about in this life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.